Welcome to another episode of Follow the Brand TV. I am your host, Grant McGall, CEO of Five Star BDM, a five star personal brand and business development company. I want to take you on a journey through another deep dive into the world of personal branding and business development using compelling personal stories, business conversations, and tips to improve your brand. By listening to the Follow the Brand TV series, you will differentiate yourself from the competition and build trust with prospective clients and employers. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. Make it one that will set you apart, build confidence, and reflect who you are. Building your five-star personal brand is a great way to improve your skills and knowledge. If you have any questions for me or any of my guests, please email me at grant.mcgall at fivestarbdm.com. Now, let's begin with our next episode on the Follow the Brand TV. Five Star BDM. Brand Development Masters is a professional consulting and advisory group keenly focused on business development services for the small to mid-sized business and entrepreneurs. Although every business is unique, they often share business development challenges that can be addressed through smart branding. Services include process improvement and operations, digital strategy and transformation, business intelligence, digital marketing and personal branding. Our business and personal branding company has helped a number of professionals and organizations to optimize and grow. This results in more business, more opportunities, better reach, positive outcomes. Visit www.5starbdm.com today to learn more. My name is Stanley Zamor, um, Florida Supreme Court certified family county circuit mediator, uh, Florida Supreme Court approved primary trainer and arbitrator. What did you hear them say? What did you hear them say? What do you think their wants are? What do you think their needs are? And what do you think you can do to help achieve those things? You can't get 100% of what you want, but you can get a degree of satisfaction. Welcome, everybody, to the Follow the Brand podcast. We are going to talk to one of Dade and Broward County's sons. His name is Stanley Zamore. He joined me on the stage here recently during Project 12. We got a chance to know each other and found out we have a, a mutual, be, be my friend, his cousin, and Stanley Lacan, who's been on this show in previous episodes. And we really hit it off and I said, Stan, you got to come on my show. You've got to talk about this because he's big into mediation. He is big into conflict resolution, which I find very, very interesting. And I want to educate the audience around these things because it's so important in our community. Stanley, you'd like to introduce yourself? Uh, good afternoon. Good morning. Salutations. <laughs> my name is Stanley Zamor. Um, Florida Supreme Court certified family county circuit mediator, uh, Florida Supreme Court approved primary trainer and arbitrator, qualified arbitrator. So I arbitrate throughout the country and throughout all the, the 20 jurisdictions of Florida, as well as, as, well as other things. 
I mean, you just threw it right out there. We got we got to go because just like myself, I'm sure there's a lot of people in the audience like, what is a mediator? He's on the Supreme Supreme Court for mediation, conflict resolution. That sounds like you like the referee between two jarring parties, you know, that are trying to get to a, a different result. Help us understand the business that you're in. Um. Well, the business plainly is conflict resolution. That's what it is. And the uh, alternative dispute resolution is what the term was as was 30 years ago, as it was toned. Um, ADR, you might see the word ADR out there, alternative dispute resolution. There's about 12, imagine a, um, a slinky, like back in the days, a slinky or a rainbow. We're on one side of the rainbow, one side of the slinky. You have partnering or negotiating between two entities or two individuals, parents, co-partners, whatever it may be, two, three, or four or more. And on the other side, you have adjudication where a third party, um, a, th a third party, like either a jur jurors, a uh, judge or an arbiter, you are you give them the ability to hear the facts as you present them, weigh the evidence, weigh the facts, and as to certain standards, depending on what state you are in or what jurisdiction you're in, they'll weigh them as instructed and provide you your decision, a decision that they come up with based on how they feel about it. Now, between the partnering and negotiating and the, the, the adjudication process, the courthouse, you have a bunch of other processes, as we call it, mediation is right somewhere right dab in the middle of that. And um, mediation is what I was drawn to. And that's what it is. So you give a third party person like myself, that's neutral and impartial, neutral and impartial are two separate different things. Um, they're neutral and impartial. And they hear not only the facts as you present them, they hear also your opinions. They hear your feelings. They hear what it took you to get to the table. And based on what you say you want, they help craft um, They help craft uh, uh, a decision or a means of action to find a solution that you create. The meter does not create it. The meter helps you along the path of creation. So it can be different every time, which, which, has, which has happened a lot. Now, you're talking to both parties, not just one. You're not representing either one. No. You're just listening to everything that's uh, uh, occurring. Now, does that happen? Like, I, you know, I think about this like, wow, because I, I, I've i been married twice. I probably need a person like yourself. I'm like, wow. You know, you need somebody like, you know, let me listen to what you're talking about, Grant, and what you're saying. And then go to the other side, well, let me hear what you're talking about, what you're saying. And then you, you listen to both, and then you're like, Huh. Based on this information, this might be a better path for both parties to mutually benefit. Is that, does that make sense? Yeah, but how about this? Based on what you shared with me, Grant, and based on what your spouse, your partner shared with me, in fact, you know what? Even better. What did you hear them say? What did you hear them say? What do you think their wants are? What do you think their needs are? And what do you think you can do to help achieve those things? You can't get 100% of what you want, but you can get a degree of satisfaction. You know what? Let's write that down and figure out what degree of satisfaction we can live with to create better paths of communication for tomorrow and the next day. End scene. So in other words, I'm not just looking at facts and ideas and feelings. My job as a mediator, whether, it, whether it's officially mediating for a case that is actually at issue, lawyers involved, tens of thousands, hundreds of millions involved, uh, uh, already invested in, in solving this case or bringing the case to suit, to pre-suit, like HOA condo or pre-suit where you have... Um, I guess parents that are separating or relocating and they're thinking about divorce, but don't want to invest in the effort and 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 the uh, emotional the emotional roller coaster called you know called the courthouse. So what else can we do? So sometimes it's a lot of times, sorry, it's pre-suit. So not only am I going to help manage the conflict as they're dealing with it, but I'm also setting them up with understanding how to better communicate. In fact. Uh, when you're a Florida Supreme Court certified mediator, well, the very first rule of ethics, rule 10.200, um, and I'm saying the actual rule because 
Lawyers should look this up. They don't. Judges looked it up. They don't. Whenever you're in a conflict and you have a third person like a meter to help you, you should know what their ethical rules are. And most do not. So you have meter, mediators out there that are running amok, hearing both sides, and said, here's what you have to do. And that's not what a mediator does. I will get my point across, and I will help you create your own path without strongly suggesting what you should do by understanding what your true wants and needs are. And very so part of what I was saying is, part of what I have to do is help better communication, okay? So from rule 10.200, 10 10.21, 10.2220, whatever it may be, um, we have specific rules on how to help them better communicate for other things, not just this one. So when it comes to parenting, co-parenting, brothers and sisters fight, fighting over their deceased mom uh, and the, or their father's assets in, in probate court, right? I, I deal with that a lot too. Or elder law, where you're dealing with, with adult kids managing the affairs of their parents while they're being taken care of in an ALF, advanced living facility or, or, or an old age home or whatever it is designated as. How do you manage that? relationship because it's a relationship they're all relationships so the good mediators understand that and help you not only craft a better way of resolving the conflict for this right now but help at least expose and have that conversation that's usually uncomfortable on how do we set it up to where the next time you have a better manner in which to communicate to get things done so you don't have to hire another mediator you don't have to file in court if you need to go for it you have have to do that. But if there's another way, is not that beneficial to just think, hey, there's your way, three ideas, your way, five ideas. There are actually an infinite amount of ways to resolve conflict usually, but we are really open to that because of how emotionally charged it is. So my job is to open those people up to more. Let's talk about this, man. This is interesting. I didn't realize the world of mediation and how it touches of so many relationships, especially in the community. We talk about social change and what you just, you yeah. brought up a point. It's about awareness. Most people, you know, they're going through their lives and, and things, all of a sudden things happen. They don't, they're not aware of the court system. They don't understand what's going to, how this all will play out over time, especially in an emotionally charged environment like a, death in a family or, you know, a separation or a business dispute. These are emotionally charged situations. And if you're not aware of mediation, you just brought up some really big things. Talk to us about the impact of mediation on communities, if they oh, are that, aware or not aware. In fact, a few years ago, um, I, I, I have a LinkedIn presence. And a few years ago, whatever was going on, whether it was Trayvon Martin, or, or it was something else, George Floyd, um, or was something in the community where people were shouting out and what we need, da, 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 da. I'm like, you know what I see here? And I was talking to some very, very well-connected, political and socially well-connected attorneys. Most usually, I would say a high percentage of medias are also attorneys. Mm -hmm. okay? So I was happened to be sitting with a colleague, very well-known gentleman, very high up in the political arena, very high up in the legal arena um, and in the inf space of influence and affluence. Um, and I sat back and said, man, all this stuff is going on. All this stuff is happening. And look at the news. He happened to be turned on. I'm like, look what's happening with, you know, whatever it was, George Floyd or wh whatever it may be, whatever happened going on at the time. I'm like, look at this. There's mothers and there's family members that are speaking out as to what to do. I see, you know, uh, statesmen like uh, like city council people and 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 um and of course clergy speaking here. And, oh, we have the mayor's office and someone from the, someone from the police station is speaking. And all these people who have specific um occupations or they are a, a, a playing a role in the loss in the community. There's no conflict resolution experts. There are no mediators. There are no facilitators. There are no conciliators. Those are just three of the other processes of ADR. Facilitation, conciliation, mediation, ombudsing, restorative justice. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a few. Um, 
other things within the processes of mediation. But there's none of those people helping bridge these gaps. There's none of people that are speaking with conflict resolution expertise. Law enforcement are experts and and uh, about uh, of what they do. Law enforcement, criminal justice, right? Lawyers, criminal justice, the law, clergy, Catholicism, and stuff like that, and 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 um other things within the religious sect. Right, families were just tied to families. Political people like the politicians, politics and policy. No one's talking about conflict resolution experts. Those that can come in and say, "Let me look on the community level how we can meld, meld and bind people to certain things of community." So actually, during that time, I did speak to some law enforcement agencies um, and did a few speeches here and there, and through the ADL, the Anti Defamation League, and some other organizations, I did speak. And we did do a series of facilitations to law enforcement on how they could better police the community. I have my own program in my mind that I've set up um, that I'm going to be doing hopefully in the very near future. But it's how we can help have better policing, better community policing by understanding. One of the very first things and one of the techniques and skill sets that real, I don't want to say real media is, properly trained mediators, I mean, mediators trained in conflict resolution, not those trained in political science who then become mediators, right? conflict resolution trained mediators, they'll, there's a lot of skills and techniques that are just different than what adjudication and the law is, a lot of different ones. And one of the ones that we look at is our biases and digging into biases, like implicit bias. So some of the trainings I've done for law enforcement was implicit bias training. When they pull out in that, they unfortunately have to protect the community and they have to eliminate a threat or address a threat. What's going through their mind when they're pulling that trigger? They're pulling out that gun. What's going through their mind when they're putting that young man, that young lady, you know, on the ground and and, and their arms are, are, are tethered behind them? What's going on when they're starting to, you know, be physical and what's, what's excessive things happen? When does it stop? What's going on in their mind? What is their connection to those things? And very few look at that when I'm hearing them say, here's what happened in this situation. Here's what happened in court. I don't see conflict resolution people being included in the conversation when they should be. So back to what mediation is. Mediation can address some of those things, if not many of those things, not all of it, but many of those things. And a lot of it is understanding a person. I know when I get involved in certain types of cases, this does not apply to all cases, but I do a lot of areas of law. So in one area of law or one area of conflict, let's just say, when I'm dealing with certain individuals where it is emotionally charged, I'll dig into that emotion. I'll elicit more of that emotion. I want all of it like a sponge. Tell me what's going on. I want to be empathetic with you. I want to understand it. So the better I understand is the way maybe I can reframe it and summarize it a certain way and get the other side to understand it. And when people understand where you're coming from, people definitely do change. And remember, we're, <laughs> I love, we're not... What, uh, 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 95 percent rational, right? No, we're 95 percent emotional. We are emotional beings. And when I hear people, especially lawyers, oh no, no, we, we gotta keep a a, a a a business decision. Yeah, you can do that, but before it makes before it's, it's a business decision, it's gonna be emotional. And in every area of conflict, even if it's two entities, even if it's corporate, even if it's, you know, intellectual property or something like that, there's a level of emotion there too. It may not be a level of emotion for the actual thing we're discussing, but the parties involved in it, the participants involved in it, they do have a level of emotion. You're dealing with human beings here, right? Not just numbers. So when you have those individuals, there is a level of emotion, a degree that a true conflict resolution trained mediator can tap in and help uh, 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 evolve what is that conflict into a solution, sustainable solution that you help them create. I'm just a, a regular guy who just, you know, have a passion for people and just helping people in any way that I can.
inspired me to want to write the book, especially to help others, was the fact that I knew I wasn't the only person going through this. So I figured if this was something that I could share with others, I owed it to get it out there to the world and to give it to other people who might be able to use it and hopefully enhance their lives. Because I feel that everyone's purpose is bigger than them. The inner circle is probably, if it's not my favorite chapter, one of my favorite chapters because it tells you how important it is to have the right people around you and in your circle and how to put everyone in the category that they need to be in to make you successful.
listen, what you said is so important. And I want to bring something to your table because we were just at Project 12. And the reason why Project 12 exists is because, and I'm talking from the aspect of the community, specifically the African-American or Black community, and this is all across America, not just uh, in our community here in South Florida, is that there is the perception that the media continuously focuses on, intentionally, on highlighting Black males in criminal situations on a nightly basis on every news outlet in America without any other, they don't look at any other thing. I don't believe there was a news truck at our Project 12 highlighting 24 uh, individuals. So I'm asking this, if, if you were my, if I was looking at you as a media, here's the conflict. The conflict is that there's a sector in the community that feels that the uh, news media, who's on the other side of this conflict, is overemphasizing uh, crime in the Black community without emphasizing any other aspects of that community within their media. All right. All right, let's go there. Um, I'm not by far saying I'm an expert in media or an expert in how journalists do their job or what happens in social media or what's, but I, but, but I have been involved in a lot of conversation. I have been involved in creating a dialogue. I have been involved in creating a, um, a conversation piece where it was like how certain things have influenced and impacted the communities and the world. So I've been in that space before. I'm not going to claim to be an expert now. I don't, if I got, I had you told me you want to go that route, I would have my numbers with me. I don't have my numbers with me, but it's okay. It's okay. Um, the human dynamic is something that's very interesting and it's always evolving human dynamics, you know, how people behave with one another. Unfortunately, it is different. The way we are in, the way we, we do communities, the way we do community now is very different than how we did community a hundred community hundred years ago. When we did a community a thousand years ago, it just is. It's going to always be evolving and changing when you do little tweaks here and there. Now we are being, um, human beings are products of their environment, good, bad, or indifferent. And right now we're in a product, we are in an environment where people want more or being told, they want, they're being told they want more faster. They want more constant. They want more, they want more. And I think it started, actually, I did look into this when I was younger. I, I think it started with, 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 with certain news papers where instead of it being a complete whole newspaper, right? I think it was new U.S. Today, I think it was a oh, Washington, D.C. paper. Right on the cover of the paper, it wasn't just that one story and three or four other stories to look into, go to page 15, go to page whatever. It was a bunch of other things on the bottom. Snippets of other things that, that might be of interest. And you know what they found out? And there is a study on this. People are more interested in the 15 five-second snippets. They can read real fast. Next one. Next one. Next one. That evolved into what we see now on TV. In fact, that's what cable news became. Cable news was a joke to networks 30 years ago, 40 years. It was a joke. You know, all, a news, a, 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 a channel that is going to be sports all the time, ESPN, garbage, they said. Oh, uh, a channel weather all the time, weather? They laughed at that. Where the network is huge, a news channel that's gonna be news all the time, CNN and and the others. But what did they do? They would have little stories, boom, 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 and our brains constantly picking things up that we like. And you know what they found out? What we do in our in our human capacity, which I don't agree with, but it is what it is. We focus on the negative more than on the positive. It just is. It just is, and. Your brain, when I do these trainings for law, for law enforcement or lawyers or judges or people of the community that want to do conflict resolution better or learn to become a mediator, um, there's several things that I do to kind of get people's minds to, to start to broaden. And one thing I ask people, ask yourself this, how many, you know, I ask you this, Grant, how many thoughts do you think 
the average person has in one day? Just thoughts. Oh, just thoughts in general? Uh, I'll say uh, 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 3,000. Good number. I've done, there's a few research studies out there, and the ones that I've looked at, one was as low as 16,000. One was as high as 60, 60,000. So between 16,000 and 60,000. I was amazed by that. But here's the most amazing part. Of both research studies, some crazy number, like 80% of the thoughts are negative. Here's what, other, here's what else bugged me out. Of the 80% that was negative, 90% was repetitive. So our brain is continually looking for information that it understands and it knows, but also at the same time, looking for information it does not know, it does not understand, to confirm certain things. Now, I'm not going to go into biases and confirmation bias and all the biases, all the different types of biases that we have in us, but it's true. We are always looking for different things. Our brain, it's not, it's, it's not consciously done. It's subconsciously done. You're looking for things that are constantly different. And when you're hearing from media, back to the media thing, when you're hearing from media things, it has to resonate with you. So when you hear, oh my God, father, father of three, stay at home dad, took kids to school. Instead of saying, Ah, uh, it's yeah, oh, 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 okay. But father of three found unfortunately deceased while taking kids to school. Father of three shot multiple times in front of toddlers on his way. Now we're like, whoa, 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 hey, hey. That's something we don't know. That's something we don't hear. That's something we don't expect. So therefore, we are drawn to it. What do you think is going to happen? Foop. I'm, I got to take my mom. My cousins, my cousin is a father of three. Holy smokes. We are going to be drawn to that. And that means money. That means advertisement dollars. That means that's the place to get the number one news. That's the person to listen to who's going to tell you the he say, she said first. That's the person that's going to confirm that in this community, they do this, that, and the third, just like what we thought. And our brains are constantly drawn to those things. We have to change what we want. We have to train with what we expect. We have to change these things. And how are we going to do it? When the money's being spent on this and the third. How are we going to do it? When, guess what? It is not me. It is not you. It is some other forces out there that are saying, hey, listen, this thing here, you're going to love. And I'm like, no, it's a small box. But after the 15th time, 30th time, and then you throw my favorite entertainer with it. Oh, my God. What is that thing? I become interested now. Yes. Yes. And then it's just a, it's just a constant process your brain is doing. And I'm going too far into that stuff. So let's just no, say. No, what you're saying, and this is, we just had this with the government. They brought the, some of the social media czars that are out there. You said, yeah, hey, the platform is attracting you know, and our kids are utilizing, but they're pouring out all this negative emotion. Um, but are we, as a as a community and as a as a people, if we are doing this intentionally, that's the point. Maybe it's a propensity for the negative, and you know this. People are gravitating, but then you're doubling down on it. And now, and now it really brings the question: You want the advertising, you want the business, and like, but is it really good? For the community is it really good for the community just like when they uh, uh cigarette smoke cigarette smoking been around for a long 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 time but then all of a sudden he said hey still cigarette smoking is killing people we know yeah a lot of advertisement around it everybody was on it there's a big billion dollar business and then they had to finally say hey this is not good we need to tell people this is not good you, but you know it's funny i i i have adult children i have younger children that, that have not yet reached adulthood um and it's funny because as I'm driving with the kids and and I'll say something like um, uh, in one of my cars, there's a, a, there's a, there's a flap um, and um, my son wanted to connect his phone to the flap um, or, or to the connection to charge his phone. I said, because I'm of a certain, I'm a, I'm a baby born in, born in the 70s, raised in the 80s. I said something really crazy to him like, 
Yeah, I, you know, I don't know if the if the, if the if the socket's there, but open up the, the where the cigarette lighter is, and I open it up. He's like cigarette lighter. I'm like cigarette lighter. Yeah, right, right here. He goes, no, nah, it's a USB connection, Dad. I'm like, no. Well, you know what? Generational. <laughs> where I'm from, where I was raised, every car had a cigarette lighter. It also, my parents had large cars sometimes in the back, even in the back seats. What did they have in the back seats? They didn't have a, they had an ashtray right there on the little uh, armrest, an ashtray. Every seat in the car had an ashtray. I remember when taking a flight for the very, well, not the very first time, but taking flights on airplanes when I was much younger in the 80s. I remember people were smoking in, in every flight. They had ashtrays that you could use on the flights, right? So as an example of the media, some people, some big conglomerate companies, not only had a hold of every movie star doing this and lighting up every detective, every housewife, every husband coming from work and, oh, I'm tired, baby. You have a light? Every bar, it was social. It was driven to us that if you're of a certain era, if you're from a certain lifestyle, if you're from a certain frustration level, have a cigarette. And they didn't say it. They showed it to you. Yes. And they showed you the cool guy, the sophisticated guy. They showed you, you know, the pimp. Like, you know, dangling. Oh, yeah. the <laughs> remember? I remember having candies. I remember having the cigarette candies where it had powder yeah. in it. So you blow it out. Even as a K through twelve, I remember that being in third grade. I'm walking around. Oh, we got we got candy cigarettes. This is cool. And I'm like, and I'm like I'm, my dad was the coolest man on the planet, baby. So I'll probably be like daddy and his brothers and his cousins. And I'm, I'm pulling it out. I remember doing this. I don't know. What, I don't know what that does to a cigarette, but I was constantly doing pulling it out. And me and my cousin were sitting there going, "Yeah, yeah, man. Our wives get on our nerves." I'm not saying my dad said that. <laughs> But that was the thing that I saw. So my point is, we're making it, we're 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 making it socially okay to be a certain way. What we need to do to address conflict resolution, mediation, community involvement, and changing this paradigm is we need to make it regular. Okay, I had somebody laugh at me. Sorry, not laugh at me. They they kind of said, "Why would you want to accept an award? You know, from from that organization? Not like there's anything wrong with it." organization, but that organization is a bunch of people that's that's bigging themselves up. A bunch of organizations that are making themselves feel good. I'm like, because who else will? Mm. My kids, my 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 nephews, uh my 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 godchildren, uh, they need to see their godfather, their uncle, their friend, their neighbor get these awards and get this these accolades so they know this is not abnormal. This is how it's supposed to be. It's not extraordinary. It's not extraordinary. It's ordinary. This is regular for us. This is what we, me, my my son and I, you know, I'm a I'm a amp kind of guy, you know, a little bit hype sometimes. And they're like, "How's your day, Daddy? I'm fantastic." Whether it is actually fantastic or not, I make the decision whether I want it to be fantastic. I make a decision whether I want it to be good. I'm supposed to go through drama. I'm supposed to have a flat tire. I'm supposed to have to get my car picked up, my bike picked up, my tow truck. These are life things that happen. <laughs> you know, the plumber has to come here later on. These things happen in life. I'm not a product of these things that some might think are negative, I'm a part of living life. So therefore, how am I going to respond to it? That's the conflict resolution media piece. How are you going to respond to it? My kids need to see me respond with a smile. A little disappointment. Oh, man. Got to deal with that again. Got to deal with that again. But you know what? It's okay. Let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. It needs to be ordinary to see these accolades, not extraordinary. And that's the problem. So how do we do that? We shout from, from mountaintops and Yes, we're doing this and we're doing that because who else will? But also, is an understanding of this is what you're supposed to do. My parents came here as immigrants, Haitian, uh, couldn't speak English for years. Within five, seven years of being in this country, they drastically changed their circumstances. And from what I understand, where they were from and how they were living was pretty nice. <laughs> it wasn't like it was dire straits. It was pretty nice. But they wanted something different for whatever their reasons were. Something different in a new country. And and um. They started up from the very, 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 very genital, whatever you consider the bottom, they were there for years. Um, changed it. So my mom, I remember my mom looking at me after I'm crying and kicking and screaming, which didn't last too long, of course, because she'll knock me out, you know. <laughs> uh, why do I have to go to dancing school? Why do I have to go to, to, to piano class again? Why, why am I doing judo on Saturday? And my mom looked at me, she smacked me, smack! 
because you're my investment. Mm -hmm. There you go. You're an investment. That's why. You're, me and your dad didn't do these things that you had the opportunity to do. So you are going to do it. And when you have kids, your job is to do the same thing. You are an investment. What if every, what if the majority of families spoke to their kids in that manner? You're an investment. You don't have time for no C's. My parents refused for me to work. And I wanted to work to get my new Jordans. I never, you know, never owned a pair of Jordans, you know, buy, buy, buy tapes and buy little things that, of course, young men growing in the 80s wanted to do, you know, break dance and buy little stuff, right? And they go, no, you're not going to work because what, you, what you're going to buy is frivolous. And you have no excuse but to get A's and B's. So figure it out. Sit down. Take your extracurricular activities that we, that, that we put you in and study and get your A's. I'm not an A student, by the way. But <laughs> they've set me up to be that. My point is, what if, what if we did that as a method of dealing with things? Of course, we all have our challenges and people have, you know, every individual that may, may have disabilities in learning or in acclimation and whatever it may be. I'm not saying be as uh, as as uh, as uh, crude as my parents were, but they did what they know. They did what they understood to make me successful. Well, let, let's go with that, Stan, because in the first question was, I think what you're saying is, yes, and if you know that there's a propensity for people to be more negative than positive, and are you as an entity encouraging that behavior or are you trying to change the behavior is really the question. And I like how you kind of frame that story like, yes, Maybe we do have 80% of our thoughts maybe start out negative. But you know what? 20% is positive. And what are we doing to grow that positive thought framework? And are we trying to double down on that and making that cool, making that something that's positive, like what your parents have done or what you're being an example uh, in front of your community with your children? Because that is newsworthy. It is something of note. And we have to be intentional because we learn that cigarettes are not good for you. And now we learn like, yeah, our kids, thank God, don't know about ashtrays and they may not know about um, uh, cigarette lighters in the car. And they might not know about these play cigarettes that we played with as children, which when you think about it, that really wasn't very smart. But that's what we did. We had to grow and learn. I think we're growing. It was and business smart learning. because, as you know, I, I I was part of that legal that legal community that that fought against big, the firms I worked with were, were were dealing with big tobacco. I'm not going to say which, which, which return, but we did do a lot of defense of that as well. And part of the things that big tobacco or what they call big tobacco, right? They, they would say in these, in these, in these secret memos, right? Was they don't care about this. They're not really focusing on the smoker of today. They're trying to groom the ones coming up. So they already knew, let me groom the ones coming up to understand societal norms, let me make them grow, grow up for that. So there's a whole plot, which is why busted big tobacco, which is why everything changed because of once those things and those memos came out, those intentions that were hidden came out. We're like 40, 50, 60 years, 100 years of tobacco being told, this is what we do, this is how we do it. So there's a, there's a, there's a business model in place to get our children to start smoking at 15, 16. Sorry, 13, 12, 13, 14, middle school. Well, let's, let's turn it around, Stan, because what you just said is so important. So if there is an intentionality of, of portraying the image of the Black male in American society in this negative format for generations, wow. And what's that intentionality like? And what do we need to do to change that? Now, I know you can answer that. We only have a few minutes there. And I know you do a column every week there for uh, uh, legacy, some other things. Think about that because that's big. Um, yeah, that's that's that, that, that's going real left to what to what things could be, should be, what I do. But it's something that I'm involved in, especially as a mentor. I'm part of the five thousand role models of America. Um, I do a lot of, uh, uh, I guess, commencement speeches sometimes for different schools or mentorship programs. I have some former high school friends. Who I became, I still am friends with from high school, and these these men and women are now principals and guidance counselors and vice principals in schools um, throughout South Florida, and they've had me come and participate and give speeches on what you know on 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 various things. 
But the one thing that I do focus on when it comes to mentorship, a lot of them have mentorship programs, um, bull anti bullying programs, cyber bullying programs. Is it's your responsibility? In fact, I, I have a friend, Aston Bright. He had me. He had me on a show. I don't even know how long ago, seven, eight years ago, but it's, it's on my website. And on the show, um, he 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 was like, you know, it was about these kids and how these kids are doing bad in the community and who's at fault and how do how can we make parenting better? I'm like, it's your fault. It's my fault. It's our fault. He's like, how am I to blame living in plantation to some kid who may have gotten a firearm in Chicago? How am I to blame with that? I'm like, well, because you're you you have a platform like this. You all, I know who he is. Like you're all over this country, all over the world with your celebrity friends, with your political charged friends. And what are you speaking about? What are you doing? You know, when you were in Chicago a few years ago, a few months ago, hey, you could have taken time with your celebrity friends and address certain things in those neighborhoods. Go in there and say, hey, listen, guys and gals, it might seem sexy and cool to be a certain way, to do a certain thing, but guess what? It's not, because what you're doing is a pipeline from school to prison, and guess what? You're funding it. They are looking for you. They need you in there. Why are you giving them what they need? What are you doing? And I told him that. He was like, it's not my fault, but yes, it is. So when I'm in those schools, when I'm in the neighborhood, when I, when, when I go to the YMCA, if I have an opportunity to just tell a young man that might look like me or or some, maybe one that doesn't look like me, I'll say, good job. Keep it up. What's, what do you look like in 10 years from now? How are you going to get there? What's going to happen when you're in high school and your friends say, hey, take some of this? Mm. What's, what, what are you going to do? How are you going to respond? How cool do you have to be and want to be? You know, and they're like, oh, Mr. Stanley, I'm like, no, 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 no. I was that kid at 12 years old going up in Queens, taking the bus, and all of a sudden, you know, some other kids come up and say, yo, listen, hey, 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 God, <laughs> try, try, you got to smoke this God because the girls are watching you. And I'm like, girls are watching, and girls are going for those guys that were doing those things, and what am I going to do? Because now I'm peer pressured into, into doing it. Mm. Didn't work, by the way. But nonetheless, I was peer pressured heavily, heavily. So what are you going to do? How are you going to handle yourself? What type of inner strength do you have in you to say, nah, it's okay. I'm an athlete. I don't know. It's okay. I have a career. No, it's okay. I'm. The, what are you doing to say no? Most of these kids are not. Because guess what? Acceptance. Selfies. Try to be cute. And they're not given those tools sometimes. So I know as a media, back to mediation, as a mediator, once I hear people's conflict, uh, once I hear what brought, okay, I do something a little bit different than most lawyers would do, which is like, what's the conflict? Uh, what are the facts supporting your conflict? Uh, what what can you achieve if you want to go to court and win at trial? What does it look like? I go deeper than that. Because I'm trying to address how do we get there? What are your true wants and needs? Not what the law allows for. Because here's the beauty about mediation too, is mediation is not about what the law allows for. It's creating something that you find satisfactory, which guess what? The law sometimes doesn't even, doesn't even come up with. So we go beyond that. Or you should want to go beyond that and craft something that is really your own because every situation is different. And I'm sometimes with the same lawyers on both sides. I have sometimes the same plaintiff, same defendant, just different date, different circumstances, and things a little bit different here, here, uh, here and here. But it's the same contract, uh, contractual breach of contract that's that I'm the, that's in front of me. And when we approach it, there's still a relationship. So I go into deeper, like, how can we navigate this conflict so the next one won't be as bad? So I do that deep, under the watermark, I say, I say uh, dive, not just on surface, beneath the surface. Because that's I'll how tell you, you Stanley, this has been, you've given us, you've answered our question. What is mediation? You've given us examples of it. We've talked about some community issues. We've talked about some things that we share the stage around our project. Well, this has been wonderful. I think our audience is getting the understanding about what we need to do as a community for some of these other issues. Like we have to take stand because there are entities out there that benefit from you know some of these uh, 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 negative uh, intentional 
advertisements that are out there to get you to do certain things. And just like with the cigarette world, you know what? Somebody takes a stand and it changes. Kudos to CVS for saying, you know what? I'm not going to sell cigarettes anymore. But that's just one aspect. I'd like to say, you know what? Media, we're not going to just show black um, criminality in our communities every single day. You know what? We're going to stop doing that. We're going to start doing something else. I'd love to see that. Before I let you go, Stanley, tell the audience how to get in touch with you and how they can read your column that you put out. All right, through uh, Legacy Magazine, which is a digital 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 standalone publication online, uh, given to us by me by by MIA Media Group. It does it is featured. Um, I think it's quarterly. Sorry, every other month by every other month in um the Miami Herald, Sun Sentinel. Um, that's how you can get it publication wise. But also go online and look for Legacy Magazine by the by MIA Media Group. That's where you'll find my things on conflict resolution, on mediation arbitrations. I'm only giving 500 words, so <laughs> it's not as expensive as it is. I've had a lot of people call me based on what I've written on how I can help them in their families or in their divorces or corporate, whatever it, it may be. I also have a uh, on LinkedIn, type in my name, Stanley Zamor. It pops up. Um, also, uh, one of my companies is is a uh, Effective Mediation Consultants. If you look at that, um, also IG, Polo Stance, Polo, S-T-A-N-Z. Uh, just type in my name, Google my name, and it pops up a bunch of things, and you can reach out to me that way. My cell number's on there, emails, and other social media things, and people call me all the time about their conflicts. Even, oh, yeah, Sunday night. I have a friend. Have a, not, not a friend of mine. Someone is going to be engaging in divorce, and already it's bad. And he's a young. He's a young man who's been accused of molestation of his children. And as he said, his children's mother is just trying to make him look in the worst light possible. He's never touched any of his children in, in any inappropriate way. But he's saying that because the kids are only three and, and one and a half. They can't speak. But that's the way that she did certain things to get him out of the house. I'm not saying this is true or not. I'm just saying this is what he told me. He wants to know how he can go through getting a divorce. And I told him, well, you need to see a lawyer if you need to see a lawyer. And you have some issues in there that might need law enforcement. Right, as well as legal counsel. I as a mediator, I give no legal advice. I'm 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 ethically barred not to do that, and I will not do that. But I can help you hopefully in how we can manage the behavior that your wife's exhibiting, children of your mother, and how you can hopefully hopefully quell that a little bit, bring it down a couple of notches. Because she's she, maybe she's hurting. Something happened that hurt her, maybe, and maybe you're not recognizing it. Maybe you're not owning up to it, and maybe you're not owning up to your part. There's a level of accountability that has to be put, has to be taken there. And then he told me some some things. I'm like, well, what you, what you, what you just told me. What do you think she would? How do you think she would respond? And then we did some work. So my point is, at all times of the day, sometimes Sunday afternoons, I get people who reach out to me. Again, no legal advice, but definitely matters in which to resolve emotional conflict we can talk about and do or techniques in dealing with narcissists. Or tech, and I have an article out there that, that's talked about, uh, sorry, I have a seminar actually, an eight-hour seminar, um, negotiating with the enemy. Uh, you know, how do you negotiate with those that you consider your enemy or your adversary or the ops, as they say in the young world today, right? <laughs> how do you navigate conflict with the with with the ops? And there are techniques. So that's how they can reach out to me, and hopefully, I can help some people at least change the mindset a little bit and the approach and get things done. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. It's about changing the narrative. This has been wonderful. I encourage your entire audience to tune into all the episodes on Follow the Brand. They can do so at the number five, that's star, that's BDM, that's B for brand, D for development, infomasters.com. Stanley, you have been dropping knowledge, wisdom, and insight all, all episode long. And I thank you for being a guest on the Follow Brand Show. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Follow the Brand TV broadcast host, Grant McGaugh as he visits with top executives and entrepreneurs to find out their secrets of success with their personal brand. Follow the Brand TV broadcast host as he focuses on brand development to build better relationships, bring value to your business, relationships, and career. You will enjoy listening to each episode that is tailored to speak to you directly. If you're looking for this type of clarity in terms of building your brand, you have tuned into the right station. Each episode will help you to shape a conversation in the five-star BDM network of 20,000 professionals and become a springboard 
for your corporate engagement and business opportunities. Each guest will frame their story in the areas of personal branding, business development, career development, financial empowerment, and technology innovation. Grant McGaw explains why he is the CEO and owner of his own professional career. Grant is an accomplished business leader and entrepreneur who wants to give back to individuals to grow their personal brand strategy. Tune in as he weaves his story about new possibilities while to you exceed expectations. If you love storytelling, this show will make for fun. Five Star BDM Brand Development Masters is a professional consulting and advisory group keenly focused on business development services for the small to mid-sized business and entrepreneurs. Although every business is unique, they often share business development challenges that can be addressed through smart branding. Services include process improvement and operations, digital strategy and transformation, business intelligence, digital marketing and personal branding. Our business and personal branding company has helped a number of professionals and organizations to optimize and grow. This results in more business, more opportunities, better reach, positive outcomes. Visit www.5starbdm.com today to learn more. Tune in for our next show or click on our website at www.5starbdm slash follow the brand TV. Thank you. Hey everyone, it's Grant McGall, CEO of Five Star BDM and host of the award-winning Follow the Brand podcast and TV series, where I help you to build a five-star brand that people will follow. My genius is personal brand development through intelligent communication and helping you achieve your business and career goals. I am a requested speaker on digital technology and brand development issues. I want to work with you to increase the value of your current opportunities while attracting new ones. Every one of you is unique and we all share challenges that can be addressed through smart branding. As a super connector, I work with you as an executive coach to guide you along the complicated business and career development road providing the enhancement tool and information you need to succeed. Together, I will help you succeed in today's challenging business climate. I will evaluate and measure your progress. Best of all, I am right alongside you every step of the way. Build the brand called you. Genius. The Black Business Expo's mission is to raise funds for high school seniors going to college or K-12 entrepreneurs. This expo is a fundraiser for students. Please, you may go to www.blackbusinessexpousa.com to donate to the scholarship fund or use the cash app at money sign BBXUSA. Our goal is to give laptops and up to $5,000 to 10 students. Students can register online at www.blackbusinessexpousa.com. Every dollar counts. Please donate to the Black Business Expo USA Scholarship Fund.